The following program is a sports handicapping show. That's right, we will be discussing sports betting and all kinds of other gambling stuff, including game predictions. As you know, not every bet will win, but we do our best. Feel free to use this information at your own risk, and remember, wager wisely, folks. Broadcasting from the Vegas Video Network Studios, live from the Las Vegas Strip, Covers.com presents Vegas Sports Day. And now from the sports betting capital of the world, here are your hosts, Teddy and the Professor. It's a Wednesday in Sin City, and you are watching Vegas Sports Day, the pulse of the sports betting world. I'm your host, Teddy Covers, joined as always by my esteemed colleague, Dave Malinsky. Today, the part of Dave Malinsky will be played by Dave Malinsky. Although Scott, Scott's rights are, he's a tough act to follow. Good show yesterday, Scott. Uh, coming up today, well, it's Leap Day. So what better day to show you how and when to jump into conference tournament action? I'm going to tell you why one particular team you should be bullish on in tonight's role. And when we get to money time, we're going to break down why one coach may not be a heel against tonight's opponent. So, Dave, first of all, you do the uh, what's coming up on today's show so much better than I do. I appreciate that. Well done. But uh, first take on a Wednesday. What did you see last night that you want to share with our viewing audience? Boy, was Brooke Lopez good. And it's something that we're going to be getting deeply into in the NBA in the days ahead. And we talked about it a little bit leading up to this point. Guys who were hurt early, who are coming out fresher, then the players are up against. I've heard so many players and coaches complaining about how grueling and demanding that schedule has been to this point. Can we start to isolate on guys who were injured, knowing that when they come back, it's a sprint for them now. This is not a grind of a schedule for Lopez. This is a sprint to the finish line. He's going to be so much fresher than guys he's up against. Look at this game last night. 38 points in only 36 minutes and 14 seconds. When you do more than a point a minute over 30 minutes, that's awfully, awfully good. 17 for 28 from the field. Darren Williams and Sandiata Gaines, the two-point guards, 17 assists for New Jersey, a lot of them going to Lopez. Not only will he be a key guy to watch in the days and weeks ahead, we've got several other guys we're going to focus on the same way. It's a very different NBA season. We have some windows of opportunity coming up. Terrific show yesterday. Well, thank, and you. thank you for all the behind-the-scenes work as well. So today you didn't have to bring in as much of the heavy lifting. So what did you have? Well, I want to talk about an email uh, we got uh, last night uh, from Coleman, uh, who had some questions. He, had, he said he had a bone to pick uh, about something that I said on yesterday's show. And I thought it was m worthy of some discussion uh, at the top of the show today. Uh, yesterday on the show, I was talking about LSU and how LSU was my only loser of the weekend, was what I said. And, of course, uh, I wasn't properly differentiating between my service record. Both Dave and I have a service at Covers Experts, but one thing that we have intentionally not done on this show is go heavy on the service stuff. This is not an infomercial for Dave's service or my service. This is a sports information show. And that's why I don't do a lot of talking about service records. But I did on yesterday's show, and that was probably a mistake. What we should be doing is concentrating not on our service records, but on the play of the day record, which eh, has been slumping in recent weeks. So uh, time to turn that around today. But I thought it was an excellent point from Coleman and uh, something that uh, I need to be a little bit more aware of in terms of talking, throwing out records on the show. From here on out, the goal is let's talk about play of the day. Let's win here on this show. And the clients, they'll do all right. I'm pretty confident of that, no question. All right, Dave. It is the day before March. March starts tomorrow. It's leap year day or leap day or whatever you want to call it. And, you know... Just around the corner, really, you know, we saw the first conference tournaments tip off last night. Uh, we saw Horizon League play uh, for one, uh, and uh, over the course of the next 12 days, we're going to see tournaments across the country. Now, March Madness, the registered trademark of the NCAA, don't even dare try to write that down uh, on a piece of paper. March we don't Madness. owe them a dollar for just saying it? I, I think we're allowed to say it, but... Don't try to write it. You know, March mayhem, March uh, uh, kookiness, call it what you will. Uh, but, sure, 
the big dance gets the lion's share of the attention. But I'll tell you what, if you talk to any professional better, Dave and myself included, there's more money to be made here in conference tournament, uh, tournament uh, the two weeks of conference tournaments, than we'll see during March Madness. Not to say there aren't March Madness opportunities, but the opportunities for the conference tournaments over the next two weeks, they're really good. Uh, I mean, the year in, year out, conference in, conference out, all kinds of opportunities. This may well be the single best cycle of the entire year when it comes to putting money uh, into our pockets. So the reason for these profits, real simple. They're tough games for the odds makers to set because there are so many new factors into play. And they're also tough games for the markets to handicap because of all those factors. Put those things together, and voila, plenty of opportunities for us. So over the course of the next eight shows, we're going to be digging deep into many of the particular conference tournaments. But for now, Dave, let's set some ground rules so that our audience can have a good base of what to look for in conference tournament action. Your first starting point is the simplest. Just win, baby. Okay, that might sound awfully, awfully um, oversimplified. But it's not. Uh, you might think that, well, teams are trying to play to win every game. Actually, they're not. Uh, so many times over the course of the season, coaches are working on rotations. They want to make adjustments. They want their team to be at their peak for these games now. So a lot of the underdogs, they're not always trying to win the games in the regular season. And a lot of the favorites, not going for a margin, just sort of working on other aspects of their game. Now it's all about winning. So a couple things to focus in on. In the NFL playoffs, we talk a lot about the reason for so many blowouts. Once a team falls way behind, you know, you're way behind middle of the season, you keep fighting because you've got to come back next week. But once you fall behind in the conference tournament games, your season's over. Team down 20, midway through the second half, they're not coming back because they don't have to go to practice the next day. Kids can have bad habits. Like, hey, the coach can't yell at me too much in practice. There will be no more practice. Underdogs don't always fight back. But the flip side of that coin if you're a favorite, you're just out there to win the game. You've got to come back and play again tomorrow. So if you're a 15-point favorite, does winning by more than 15 matter? No, it's just about winning these games now. Yeah, and of course, so we talk about the factors for conference tournaments. We also want to discuss totals. I mean, totals are a big piece of the equation at this time of the year. And we're going to see, particularly in these close games, final minutes that last forever, or what seems to feel, what feels like forever, where teams are going to continue to foul, continue to jack up three-pointers at the other end. And it's not unusual in conference tournaments, in tight games that are separated by, let's say, two or three possessions uh, in uh, the final minute. You can get 20 extra points on the board in that final minute if the losing team hits a couple of three-pointers and uh, the team leading can hit some free throws. So you see some dramatic differences in totals. Whereas when a team's down 20, they're not fouling. You know, you find a team that's 13 and 16, and this is their last game. They're not getting a, a bid to the NIT or the CIT or the CBI or any of the other minor conferences. They're done, uh, and you're not going to see fouling. You're not going to see those late scramble points. So one of the key factors for handicapping totals in conference tournament play is you have to handicap the side to have a correct total wager, which makes things uh, fairly inter uh, interesting. And you know, uh, Dave, you know, talk about the blowouts and the issues where it can flow seamlessly right to the buzzer. Yeah, because we'll see some of this start actually tonight. And we want you to get in the mindset of these coaches and players. Santa Clara's playing Portland tonight. Big deal, right? You're not going to watch, right? But you know what each coach is able to do in the locker before the game? Hey, guys, the NCAA tournament starts right now. If we win every one of our games, we're the champions. Okay, that sounds real far-fetched. If you're Santa Clara, the kids are going, yeah, yeah, thanks, coach. But you can do that. That's why when you look at these close games with close lines, you don't go down without a fight. You're down by six with 30 seconds left. That's your 30 seconds to get into the tournament and possibly win a national championship. So they will not go down too easily. Sometimes it's these pick em games that are the best because they will scramble it and scramble it and scramble it all the way out. Uh, we may see an entertaining game at the Orleans tonight. We're, nothing in our pockets, most likely, on Santa Clara, Portland. But think about that idea. We are in the NCAA tournament tonight. We win every game. We're the champions. And even a 5-23 and 23 team like the Broncos uh, can think that. But let's continue on with some of those rules and things to look at 
for these conference tournaments. Here's the next one. We'll call it, We've Seen This Movie Before. Almost all games will now be rematches. Many of these games in conference tournaments will be the third meeting between those two teams over the course of the last two, two and a half months. So whenever possible, we like to look back at those first meetings and certainly the rematches. You know, we look for game flow situations and statistical pendulums that are likely to swing back towards the norm that could have stretched too far in any given ballgame. We also want to be aware of key players that may have been missing for an earlier game or are missing for the rematch. And in general, we really want to be aware of, particularly when we're talking about third meetings, we want to be aware of that rematch, the regular season rematch. The second meeting, as a general rule of thumb, carries more weight than the first meeting because both coaches were already in adjustment mode against their particular opponent. Now, if they didn't get revenge the second time, you want to be careful the third time. We'll hear a lot of people use the phrase double revenge at tournament time. They got double revenge against this. Well, you know what? If you didn't get it the second time, there might be something inside of that matchup that precludes you from getting it the third. So we'll do the game-by-game -game breakdown. If you got beat bad in one category in the first game, if you close the gap a little in the second, okay, maybe you can close it a little more into the third. But if you couldn't close the gap from game one to game two, there's no reason to believe you'll close it anymore into the third. The only time we find double revenge working is when the line is so high, the favorite doesn't care. You've got a favorite that's dumped on a team twice. They're not going to get motivated for that game. But the coach will see, you know what? We win tonight. We've got to come back Friday. Got to come back Saturday. This is a chance for me to skid through this game. Yeah, we're favored by 18. So what? If we win it by 10 or 12, I keep my better players fresh. For the next game, we say this because the higher lines are going to be the opening rounds of most of these tournaments. Lines will get tighter as the better teams advance. So sometimes we'll try to sneak a double revenge in because the favorite won't care about the margin. But be careful with that double revenge concept. If you couldn't get it done the second time, there may be a reason why you just can't get it done at all. I know many of you out there in viewer land are going to have questions about these conference tournaments and about why we love this particular cycle more as, as much as any cycle throughout the course of the season. You talk about bowl season, you talk about preseason NFL, you talk about arena football, you talk about baseball going into the All-Star break, all of these great times for making money. This cycle may be the best. But if you have questions, please send them in. The address, sportsday at covers.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, at Vegas Sports Day. And you can get involved in the community. Active threads and discussions going right now covers.com slash posting forum. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention one more time, we're looking to put together a March Madness party the Wednesday before the big dance. If you're going to be in Vegas, make sure you're checking out Dave and I live at a remote. Details will follow shortly, but they are coming. Looking for a good handicapper to follow in conference tournament action? How about Roy Williams caddy? We're going to tell you what that means coming up next. You're watching Vegas Sports Day. Are you looking for the latest odds, the fastest scores, the most important trends, and the best matchups and stats? Are you looking for the key late-breaking information that can make you a winner? Well, Covers.com has the answer. The world's largest sports betting community gives you a front-row seat in the heart of the action, from the opening lines to the final scores. If you want to stay ahead of the game, Covers covers the numbers. Oh, hello there. My name is Brandon Gooch Han, host of Awkward Silence 2.1. And when I'm not living vicariously through Chris Phillips, I'm on VegasVideoNetwork.com. We're not done with conference tournament talk just yet. We're only getting started. In Market Watch today, we're going to talk about some more of the issues teams face when it comes to these conference tournament uh, situations. Now, one of the things you're going to see in the conference tournaments that you won't see in March Madness, that you haven't seen anywhere since really the uh, Thanksgiving or the uh, Christmas or a couple of tournaments over New Year's, is teams playing in these back-to-back -back cycles or even back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, or even in the Big East like UConn did last year, back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back. Uh, they can play as many as five nights in a row. 
None of these teams, of course, have played in any back-to-back -back situations in the year, calendar year of 2012, and some never did at all. So we need to understand the depth of each team and who can play better on the second or third or fourth or fifth nights uh, when they're forced to be playing in a row. As is the case with almost everything we talk about, there's no exact formula because of the one issue. These are young guys, and there is an adrenaline factor that comes into play. So we'd like to be able to sit there and say, okay, teams whose starters average more than 37 minutes do this the following day. But there's this very fine line we find between a team that is gassed, worn out, and can't come back, and this team at a special level of adrenaline. Connecticut's got so high last year that it never did wear off at all. It carried all the way through to an NCAA tournament championship. If you watch that Big East title game last year, that was not a tired team. That was a team playing at a special level of adrenaline. So you've got to figure out who can do it and who can't. But also, as you evaluate these games, the tempo really matters. Kids who go the full 40 minutes in a slow game, they can come back fine the next day. Uh, sometimes 40 minutes of a slow tempo, let's say like a Notre Dame, you know, might be playing in the Big East tournament. Fine the next day. But sometimes 36 or 37 minutes at a faster pace can be exhausting. So we'd like to be able to say, you know what, here's the formula. There just isn't one. Now, game by game next week, we'll try to walk you through some of those situations as we see them, but it's an inexact science, and an inexact science is an art. Then in measuring depth, probably going to be as much art as science come next week. Yeah, so we talked about the depth gauge. Now let's talk about something we like to call courting advantages. Now it's important that we break down what the venues mean in terms of shooting sight lines and also crowd advantages. For some teams, the latter rounds of a tournament bring big edges, legitimate big edges, when it comes to having a uh, home court presence or uh, enormous crowd support. And Kentucky is example number one. Uh, you know, these Kentucky fans are very, very savvy. Many of them can't get tickets to the conference tournament. So what happens? They'll go, they'll hang out for a couple of hours, and then as teams lose, They'll buy tickets from the, fan, from the fans of the losing teams. Uh, so what you see is that Kentucky's edge in the first game of the SEC tournament may not be that great, but that edge increases with every given game that they win. And by uh, should Kentucky be playing in the SEC uh, championship, uh, in the finals of the SEC tournament, you know, they'll have, what, a 5-1 to one crowd advantage? doesn't matter who they're going to play. So if you're a South Carolina alum and you go to the tournament, and your team loses on Thursday, you get these extra tickets, look for someone wearing Kentucky blue, you can get a little more. You know, good markup on those tickets the rest of the way. Absolutely does happen. So for some of these teams, and we'll tell you who they are specifically when we break down the game by game next week, that court advantage will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Other things also happen, though. Kids will shoot a little bit better. Sometimes the first round is the worst shooting round of the tournament. Because for many of these players, it's the first time they've ever been on this particular court. You get to the second game, you get to the third game, it gets a little bit easier, especially as the rounds dwindle the teams. Part of the problem is on Fridays next week, teams will not be able to have shoot-around because a lot of these venues will have four games being played. Come Saturday, and it's reduced to only two games at a venue, or come Sunday when it's down to one game at a venue, you also get a shoot-around that day. So a lot of times people say, well, Gee, these kids are going to wear down. The scores will be lower, deeper into a tournament. No, they're getting to know the environment better. Sleeping in the same beds several days in a row, but they get to know that particular court. So what do we do a lot? We'll chart the court on Thursday. How well did all teams shoot here to see if there are particularly difficult sight lines that come into play? Uh, the SEC tournament's a good example, though. They're playing in New Orleans, but not in the Superdome. They're going to play in the arena where the Hornets play. Sight lines will not be nearly as bad as they would have been in a bigger environment. So courting advantages does matter. When we get to specific brackets, we'll tell you how some teams might be worth a point or point and a half because of the particular venue it's going to be played at. And there's one more thing we need to discuss here, Dave. We're breaking down uh, the concepts behind betting these conference tournaments. Uh, let's call it end game gambits. Now, close games, which we'll see plenty of over the course of the month of March. Second and third meetings between teams that have already played each other at least once. Boy, these two types of ball games, tight games 
and rematches or double rematches it makes certain factors for teams really stand out. Number one, point guard play. Number two, coaching. The teams with the best point guards and or the best coaches have legitimate edges at this time of the year. Now, it's a natural logic to play on the better coaches. You know, by this time, the full season power ratings, they're pretty much hammered into place uh, everywhere. And they're based on how teams have performed against all different types of competition in all different types of games. Blowouts, close games, weak teams, strong teams, those full season power rating formulas don't differentiate. But sometimes only a handful of those games end up being close and end up being relevant when we think about what's going to happen in these conference tournaments, when you bring the X's and O's tactics legitimately into play. So, Dave, I know there's one particular coach you want to highlight right here, someone who doesn't necessarily put his full effort into winning his conference tournament. Yeah, and we can bring this one up because it's getting to be known a little bit so well that we're not giving anything away anymore. But uh, when we talk about these coaching aspects, you got to talk about a guy like Roy Williams, who genuinely does not care, and we emphasize, does not care if his team wins the ACC tournament, because his take is, you know what, we want to win the national championship. Right now, three games in three days against tough competition, that's not necessarily in the best interest if you want to win the national championship. 17 ACC tournament games since he became the Carolina coach. How about two? 13 and two against the spread. A guy who could shop for line value might have been able to go 15 and two playing against Williams in these games. Uh, hence one of the jokes that we you know, talked about earlier on the show. People say, okay, how's Carolina going to play this year? Check with Roy's caddy and see if he's already got a tee time scheduled for Saturday afternoon or Sunday planning, oh, yeah, we're going to lose tomorrow. I'm going to go play golf. Uh, it's been joked about so much that it probably will find its way into the line. But think about it from a logical standpoint. He knows that winning these games doesn't necessarily help his teams all that much in the grand scheme. There are a few other coaches like that who do not go all out in these tournaments this year. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Some of the other setups, though, that Teddy talked about, close games. You want to do a good exercise next week. Monday and Tuesday are going to be slow for most of you. Not a lot on the board those days. Look ahead to the Thursday and the Friday first round matchups. Take teams that are going to be in short spread games, four points or less, and look at how many times all season they were either in games with the line that short or in games where the result was close. You may find a lot of these teams being penciled into a close game, like Teddy said, who just haven't been through many. Sometimes those coaches can be the most vulnerable. Up next, we're going to head to the NBA hardwoods. Full breakdown of college tournaments in the rearview mirror. Full breakdown of tonight's NBA and college games up ahead. We'll be right back here on Vegas Sports Talk. Let me know when I'm live. Hi everybody, this is Bridget Magnus of Getting Real Estate in Vegas, and you are watching the Vegas Video Network. <laughs> Livestream is your premier place to watch live events on the web, mobile devices, and connected TVs. See new events daily or broadcast your own at Livestream.com. Livestream, be there. Okay, guys, it's m -m -m money time. This edition of Money Time is brought to you by Covers.com. Remember, for all the key information you need in every sport, Covers covers the numbers. Uh, let's start tonight in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where Oklahoma City, a three-and-a-half-point road favorite, against the Sixers this evening. Now, we saw Philly snap out of their nasty losing skid, an ugly skid they had before the All-Star break, with a resounding blowout victory at Detroit last night. Now, the question is, did they get some swagger back with that win, or did they simply do what they do, which is grind out weak opponents because they play smarter basketball and better defense than uh, most weak teams do? You know, this 76ers strength of schedule still checks in at only number 27 out of 30 NBA teams. They have faced a very weak slate through the first half of the campaign. So there are two issues to discuss. Number one, is this team overrated in general because of the success they've had against a relatively weak slate? And number two, 
How do they handle close games against good teams? Who is the go-to player? We've seen Louis Williams. Eh, he's had some problems as their go-to scorer during crunch time. Not sure that Doug Collins necessarily has an answer for that, which is not a problem that Oklahoma City had. They do not share those same issues. During crunch time, who do they go to? Uh, they got a couple guys named Durant and Westbrook who tend to be pretty good in tight ball games. So let's make this a starting point. Similar to what we just talked about for the college tournament, this is going to be a close game tonight. It's projected to be. If the odds makers are right, Oklahoma City's up three with two minutes left, how does it play out? Well, let's take a look at how these teams have done in competitively priced games this year. The table that we call, let's say, close encounters of the court kind. These are going to be lines <laughs> of minus four to plus four. That means you're favored by four or less or an underdog of up to plus four. Basically, those are games in which you're relatively even with your opponent, and it falls inside the purveys of the home court advantage. Look at Philadelphia in these games this year. Only 5-11 and 11 straight up, 5-10-1 and 1 against the spread. Oklahoma City, look at the flip-flop. 7-4 and 4 straight up, 7-4 and 4 against the spread. It shows that the Thunder have been so much more effective in endgame situations but yet there's one little caveat here that is cause for concern. That table might say, give us Oak City, because if it's close late, they have the go-to players. But there's a little basketball polish issue that goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, it certainly does, Dave. And if you're making a case for Philadelphia plus the points as home dog tonight, this, I would assume, would be a big part of your argument. Philadelphia, number one in the NBA in fewest turnovers committed per game. Just 10.7 turnovers per game committed by the Sixers offensively. No one else in the league is even close to Philly in that particular statistical category. The number two team, 13.4 turnovers per game. So Philly, like 2.7 turnovers per game, per game, better than any other team in the league in that regard. Oklahoma City, well, they're tied for last, turning the ball over just shy of 17 times per game. Philly, Number one in the NBA in net turnover margin, plus 3.8 per game. Oklahoma City, number 29 out of 30 NBA teams in turnover margin at minus 3.1. So the Sixers, even with some issues when it comes to close games, certainly you can make a case for Philadelphia in this contest based on their ability to get easy buckets of OKC mistakes. Big time showdown in San Antonio tonight, possible NBA Finals preview. We've got the host Spurs laying two uh, against Chicago. Uh, could we say remember the Alamo to set this one up? Because the question is, can the Spurs do it? Haven't played a home game since February 4th. They did go 8-1 eight and, eight and one on that rodeo trip. The only loser, a game they decided to give away at Portland uh, when Pops rested Duncan and Parker. But you know, when you break teams down at the All-Star break and you look through this first half of the San Antonio schedule, as much as we've liked Greg Popovich in the past, could you make a case he just had the best half season of coaching in NBA history? Think about this. Of all of his players that were hurt at one time or another, comes in with the number three record in the NBA, and that's despite having been up against the number two schedule. Duncan didn't play every game. Parker didn't play every game. Ginobili didn't play about half of the games. Bringing so many new faces into the rotation he says the number two schedule, and he comes away with the number three record. Brilliant, brilliant coaching by him. Now, what makes it an interesting issue tonight is because of that brilliant coaching, they're favored. And when you find the Bulls as the underdog, which is rare, you do have to stand up and take a look. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen Chicago as an underdog a lot this year or in seasons past. The Bulls have faced the number 29 schedule in the NBA this season compared to the number two schedule that San Antonio has faced so far. But Chicago as an underdog, look at this chart. Uh, I mean, it's pretty darn clear what the Bulls have done. This is since Christmas Day 2010. So from the back, uh, from the, the final three quarters of last season and then through this season. They've been underdogs only eight times in those games. Seven and one straight up. Eight no against the spread. And you know the only game they lost earlier this year at Miami that was a game where Derrick Rose, kind of like last night, we didn't give the fans the Big Mac. In this instance, Rose at the charity stripe missed with a chance to tie, uh, I believe take the lead at the end of that ball game. He missed both free throws, uh, and the Heat were able 
uh, to come away with the victory. But Chicago was right there in that game, like they have been in all of these games when they've been trying to step up in class. Yeah, question tonight uh, in terms of backing Chicago, are the legs necessarily going to be there? That first night back after the All-Star break, Supposed to be an easy time against New Orleans. Uh, it wasn't. They had to score the last eight points of the game just to escape with the win. Uh, Luol Deng, 41-35. Derrick Rose, 40-49. That's not how you wanted to play come, before coming into San Antonio. And take a look at what Popovich has to do one more time. Look at this roster shuffling. Manu Ginobili practiced a little bit yesterday. He won't play. Kawhi Leonard didn't practice yesterday. They don't expect him to play. Tiago Splitter, not going to play. Gary Neal. Made some awfully big shots for them on the rodeo trip. He didn't practice. They're listing him as a game-time decision. The one guy who may be on the court again, T.J. Ford. Haven't seen him for a while. He looked pretty good at practice. They'll try to get some minutes for him. But once again, this masterful, masterful juggling job Popovich is doing, he's going to have to do it one more time. When we come back, it's time to go to the college hoops board for Wednesday night as money time continues. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. Most Vegas media companies think if it doesn't jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. Money time, part two, and I'm, I'm trying to work a Davy Jones reference in, but I don't know. Uh, are, are, you, are you a believer, Dave? I don't know. Let's go to Philadelphia. Let's go yeah, somewhere. Yeah, there's just no way Let's to get that. out of it. Uh, rest in peace, Davy Jones. Uh, let's go to West Lafayette, Indiana, in fact, where tonight the Purdue Boilermakers, 11.5-point home chalk against the Penn State Nittany Lions. And we look at the first meeting between these two teams, and boy, this one is going to raise your eyebrows. Just... Kind of like that, uh, because you're not going to see many bigger margin from the point spread games than we did in the first meeting between these two teams. Penn State was a 7.5 point home underdog. They won the game by 20, 32 to 18 at halftime, ran away with it in the second half. Purdue was never in the ball game. The Boilermakers in that contest, boy, they couldn't shoot. 15 of 47 overall, just 6 of 23 from beyond the arc. They lost the battle of the boards to Penn State, 35-25 to 25 in that contest. There was a wild card to consider. Billy Oliver knocked down seven three-pointers for the Nittany Lions, but he had to end his college career about three weeks ago dealing with the aftermath of multiple concussions. So Oliver, the Boilermaker slayer in the first meeting, not going to be around for the rematch. Someone else not around for Purdue in the rematch. Uh, Kelsey Barlow on the other side of the equation. You might think, oh, that's a bad thing they lost him. Maybe not. Uh, let's take you back a week and a half. A uh, little bit of an off-court incident. Matt Painter has to suspend two players. Kelsey Barlow permanently, DJ Bird for one game. They go out and they get thumped by Michigan State, which has happened to a lot of teams down the stretch. We found something interesting after that game, though. Purdue senior Ryan Smith makes the following prediction. and this, Now, this is just after they had lost to Michigan State. Smith talking about the absence of Barlow. What does he have to say? It's addition by subtraction. Yeah, that looks a little bit lonely on a big chart, but that is such a significant statement because this is a senior. This guy was out there playing every game, and he's predicting something here. So what did they do after that Michigan State loss? Uh, they blow Nebraska away, 83-65. to 65. They go to Michigan as five-point underdogs, win the game by 14, and Michigan's been playing awfully, awfully good basketball. They beat the spread by 26 and a half points in those two games. 31 assists versus only 12 turnovers. Playing some of the best chemistry basketball that we've seen in quite some time. Now, not only is there that revenge motive from the earlier Penn State game, but there's a little bit of a fire in the belly. We talk about these last home game situations and how much they mean. We had just talked about one of the guys right now playing in his last home game. How about Robbie Hummel and Lewis Jackson also? Three guys that have meant a lot to that program, 73 home wins in Robbie Hummel's career. 
Purdue's going to be able to throw a pretty good punch in this rematch. Question is whether Penn State can stand up to one. Well, the Nittany Lions have played eight road games in Big Ten play so far. They've lost all eight of those games by double-digit margins. They did cover once. They covered against Wisconsin in their last outing. They were 14-and-a-half uh, point dogs. They only lost by 10 and actually made a decent run in the second half of that ballgame after looking like they were going to get blown out early. Uh, cut the lead to, uh, I think it was about five or so, but uh, uh, the Badgers were able to pull away for the non-covering victory. But again, 0-8 straight, straight up, 1-7 against the spread as Big Ten road underdogs. This has not been Penn State's best role. And, you know, Tim Frazier, he's a, he's a competitor, no question. Penn State's best player, 38.1 minutes per game in Big Ten action. That's 16 Big Ten games already. He scored 19.9 uh, uh, points per game in those. The rest of the team, not just the starters, the whole team has just 40 points per game. So he's scoring a third of his team's points, which is a concern, obviously, as the season wears down. He also has 90 of their 163 team assists. So there's not much Frazier doesn't do, but we've seen his three-point shooting percentage drop. He's under 28% uh, for the year now. And, and Lewis Jackson did a very nice job on him in the first meeting between these two teams. No reason to think he won't be able to have similar success in the rematch. Let's go to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The host Tar Heels now laying around a 17 and a half over Maryland. Numbers a little bit higher early in the day. You may see it get back to 18 before a tip off. It's an ESPN game. You can always get a little bit of late money to the favorite in this type. But if someone bets the favorite, are they doing the right thing? We talked about Roy Williams earlier on the show about how little he cares about winning the ACC tournament. One thing he does care about, the ACC regular season crown. Uh, to do that, the big showdown coming up, seven miles down the road, at Durham Saturday night against Duke. As big a revenge game as we'll see from an emotional standpoint because of the way Duke rallied late to beat Carolina in the Dean Dome the first time around. So a little bit of a distraction issue for Roy Williams with the Duke game on deck, for his players as well. So let's take a look back through the years. How has North Carolina done? the game before facing Duke, it hasn't been very good. Uh, yeah, 13 and 4 straight up because they've been the superior team. They were favored in all 17 of those games. But how about 4 and 13 against the spread? It's Roy's way of saying, look, let's win the game. Let's take care of business. We got something bigger on deck. I think this matters more for two reasons than it usually does. One, again, the nature of that first loss to Duke. But two, a very depth-shy Carolina rotation right now. Injuries have them down to really about a seven-player rotation. That win at Virginia on Saturday, the starters go 172 out of the 200 minutes. If your starters are playing a lot of minutes, if you've got Duke ahead, then the tournament ahead, then the big dance ahead, yeah, this is just one of these nights where you might just want to win the game and get off the court. Yeah, there's also a couple of other factors to consider when we break down the Maryland-North Carolina matchup for this evening. And maybe the first place to look is at the Maryland head coach, Mark Turgeon, in his first year with the Terps. Well, guess what? He was an assistant under Williams at Kansas back in the day. And if you're thinking that uh, Williams, oh, he wants to rub it in the face of his former assistant, take a look at this quote. This quote really speaks volumes about how we expect Roy Williams to be coaching tonight's ball games. The first game closed out with a late dunk uh, by Henson that just wasn't necessary in the uh, flow of the game. They could have dribbled out the clock. Here's Williams' quote. I probably would have liked it better if John Henson hadn't gone in and dunked it. That's because of my feelings for Turge that I didn't want it to end like that. So clearly, Roy Williams not looking to run up the score on one of his former assistants and a guy that he considers to be a good friend. And, you know, we talk about Manny being Manny. Roy will be Roy in one other way this evening. Stuart Cooper, Patrick Crouch, David DuPont. They're all seniors on the North Carolina roster, and they're all walk-ons, guys that don't see a lot of playing time. They get plenty of practice time. And they get all the uh, floor burns in that. They don't see a lot of time on the floor. So what's going to happen with these three senior walk-ons? Rumor has it Roy Williams going to start all three tonight. They'll get a few minutes of playing time, a couple of possessions, but North Carolina not going to go with their best lineup for the full 40 minutes this evening. And Dave, does that set us up for something perhaps? There's a big window of opportunity both early and late in this game. 
Uh, you got a chance for Maryland to get out of the gate. Well, your fear with a big road underdog falling behind early, not likely to happen with that group of walk-ons out there. And in the latter stages, eh, Roy wants to get off the court. He's got some business to attend to come Saturday night in Durham. So yeah, give us that 17 and a half with Maryland as a play of the day. Don't be surprised if the 18s creep back into play by tip-off. 17 and a half is good enough. Be patient. You may find a little bit more. Yeah, Roy wants to win the game tonight, but that's all. He just wants to win it. Maryland plus the points. That's the play of the day for Wednesday. And Dave, that's going to wrap it up for another fine edition. Thanks to you, our viewers and listeners, so much for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us. For Malinsky, I'm Sobransky. Enjoy the games and good luck. We'll see you again tomorrow.